Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to KB Foursquare Church. Let's go and stand to our feet. We're going to praise Jesus this morning. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. And all my failures I tried. When you call
good guys that is so good and uh today we're talking about rest and the message that james is going to give here in just a few minutes as he talks about rest in this next part of our worship i just want to tell a story with what we have here because we're in exodus and we're talking about how god has brought his people out of slavery he brought his people out of bondage where they were there for a long, long time. And when God brings them out and he tells them, just be still, I will fight for you. He's able to do so. He's able to defeat the Egyptians at that time. And then after God's people sees this, they're just in awe and they just continue to praise him with their mouths. They, they, they're in what's called the fear of the Lord. They just come to respect and love who he is and what he has done for them. But I, I believe that the, the most beautiful part of that story is what happens after, is when they're in the wilderness, um, they turn against God. God's people, his own people, who he freed, turn against him. And regardless of that, God's all-pursuing love keeps his promise. God keeps his promise to his people all the way to Jesus. And that's what I, we call that song we're going to sing a little while, Reckless Love. But let's just tell a story in remembrance of what God has accomplished already and rest in that, rest in his accomplishments, guys, because the finished work is already done. Now comes the part where we have a relationship. Now comes the part where we just be still and worship him. Amen. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child.
Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. pursue us, even though we've turned our back on you so many times. Lord, teach us to be faithful because you're faithful. Teach us to be constant because you're constant. Sanctify us, Lord. 
Give us power to follow you. We thank you, Lord. Forever and ever. And everyone said, Amen. Well, let's go ahead and turn to each other and greet each other this morning. morning. Welcome to church. So good to have you guys here with us this morning at Canby Four Square Church. If you would return to your seats, we will continue with this morning's service. Wow! Hey, I love all you guys. So happy to have you here. My name is Pastor James. Uh, Pastors Ron and Annette send their love. They're out of town this weekend. Uh, Annette, if you don't know, is amazing in so many ways. Uh, she has partnered with a nonprofit called Rescue Freedom, and they work with people escaping the sex trafficking, human trafficking trades. They provide shelters and transition homes for ladies coming out of that situation. And so they do, it's like a jogathon, but really weird because instead of just like jogging, they hike in the enchantments up in Leavenworth, Washington, like 24 miles in a single day. Um, and so they're raising a ton of money. You can go on to that next photo to kind of see the scope of what they're dealing with. Uh, so she was up at like 3 in the morning uh, to get all that stuff done. So anyway, very proud of her. And then she and Ron are just enjoying some vacation time this weekend as well. So we just try to do these things because we want to be a generous people. We want to invest into the mission of what God is doing to redeem all aspects of his creation. And this local church body exists to make disciples who make disciples for Jesus. And so when you give to Canby Four Square Church, you're giving into the mission of having the gospel preached and proclaimed every week, of investing into our community and partnering with schools and first responders and key components so that we can really make a difference in Canby, in the region, and then throughout the world, we're, we love Karen Armstrong, who is one of us, who is partnering with YWAM to go serve and develop leaders there. Uh, Brenda and Elijah, who have been working with YWAM in Bible translation in the South Pacific. Like, there's a lot of areas that we try to say, Lord, help us be a generous blessing so that the gospel expands, the kingdom is brought, and Jesus is glorified. That's why we give. So let's go ahead and pray. We'll invite our ushers forward. And then we'll continue. Jesus, help us to be good stewards of what you have entrusted to us. 
Help us to be faithful and wise with our money. Help us to be generous and invest into the kingdom because we know that it will bear eternal fruit. Lord, we want to see this money grow and be multiplied for the sake of the kingdom and for your glory and for the good of others. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, as always, Hudson Mickle with the announcements. I am so excited that you have decided to join us here this morning at Camby Foursquare Church. My name's Hudson Mickle, and I have just a few announcements for you. Women's Retreat featuring Bo Stern is coming up in October. Registration will open August 28th. So we just wanted you all to be ready because last year we actually sold out in just a couple of days. So be ready. Registration opens August 28th. CBC has extended its deadline for classes, but just for a few days. So go online this week to canbybiblecollege.org to sign up for a fantastic lineup of classes. Wednesday, September 5th is our taco feed. And this year we will have mariachis and of course, lots of tacos. So bring your friends, bring your family and come and enjoy uh, a fantastic evening here at Camby Foursquare Church. All right, everybody, that's all the announcements I have for you today. Remember that all this information can be found online at canbyforsquare.com and prayer teams will be available for you after the service and they would absolutely love to pray with you. Good morning again. So good to see each of you guys. Um, if you don't know, I'm James, and I get the privilege of being the dean at that Canby Bible College across the street. If you don't know, your church has a world-class two-year Bible teaching and leadership development school. And so we do one thing really well. We provide a transformational biblical education at an affordable price. You know that whole thing about school loan debt and how colleges have gotten really expensive over the years? We haven't. We still continue to provide a really amazing education for $100 a credit hour. You can graduate from CBC and only spend 6,500 bucks for a whole two-year program that will equip you to go lead and serve or simply just establish a Christian worldview. So I encourage you, there's still time. Hudson mentioned the deadline, but let's just agree that we've all talked to the dean and I've given you a bit of a break so you can still register if you want. You don't have to be called the quote unquote full-time ministry. Frankly, if you're a Christian, you are in ministry already and we exist to help equip you to do that better to make a difference for Jesus. Really is an absolute gem. I would encourage you to take a look at some of the classes that are offered both during the day. Two evening classes. I will point out the one on Thursday night. It's taught by a guy named Doug Marshall. Um, it's communication for leaders. If you've ever found yourself in a situation where you're like, oh, that went poorly. <laughs> that conversation could have gone better. Um, there's a solution for that, and it's learning how to speak the truth in love and it's learning how to reflect Jesus and build the kingdom one conversation at a time. That class is excellent for anyone. You had no college experience required. I encourage you to sign up. All righty. Uh, I am the husband to one and the father to three. You can see all my tribe there. Uh, my oldest is as serious and thoughtful and, and a big reader, just like his dad. And then less than two years after he was born, uh, we gave birth to twins, the Bible says that children are a blessing, but when you have three of them in less than two years, sometimes you wonder if that's actually true, because it was hard, it was really hard. We didn't sleep for a long time. We kind of became this like sleep-deprived, subhuman monster, but we made it through with the grace of God and the generosity of so many people in this church. It's wonderful. I love my boys. They're growing up to love Jesus, respect women, make lots of money. It's going to be good. Um, <laughs> if you're curious about what a home with three little boys is like, my wife had to do this recently. <laughs> so, just, uh, so just pray for my wife <laughs> if you see her. Her problem is, is that she's got four boys and one toilet, so... 
It's just, it's, we're just a hot mess, I'll tell you what. Uh, a few months ago, anybody go, know a guy named A.J. Swoboda? But in, A.J. Swoboda is a total gift to the church. He's a four-square pastor, four-square pastor, leads Theophilus Four-Square Church here in Portland. Um, he's a scholar and a gentleman, and he writes a book. He wrote a book called The Subversive Sabbath, The Power of Rest in a Nonstop World. And this book asked the question, what would happen if Christians actually took all of the Ten Commandments seriously? He said, I was in a church meeting once, and I realized that if I, um, if I committed murder or cheated on my wife or embezzled money, I would get fired. But if I broke the Sabbath, I'd get a raise. And he said that, hmm. And so he writes this book about Sabbath, about what it means to keep one day a week as set aside, as different. It's a fascinating book. Uh, it's heavy. It's college level. It's good. I encourage you to read it. If, you're, if that's not inter- entertaining to you, I got a chance to sit down with A.J. Swoboda. We did an interview for about 30 minutes. He unpacked so many of the big ideas around that book. If you go to the Canby Bible College YouTube channel, just type in A.J. Swoboda, Canby Bible College, and YouTube, you'll get this, and you'll hear him talk about it for about 30 minutes. It's a pretty good time. So I read this book, and I really benefited from it, and so I've been thinking about this idea of rest. So that's what we're going to talk about today is what is the result of resting, of taking one day out of seven as set apart? Uh, Whenever I preach, I try to condense the entire sermon into a single sentence. If you've been around, you know I like to call it a sermon in a nutshell. Sermon in a nutshell is my gift to you to answer the question, what did you talk about at church today? So if anybody ever asks you, what did we talk about at church today, here's what you tell them. You say that the result of rest is seeing the salvation of God. That's the sermon in a nutshell, that the result of rest is seeing the salvation of God. That was when we entrust our lives, our activity, our future into the hands of God, we see his saving power at work in our lives. All right? To do this, we're going to demonstrate this idea out of Exodus chapter 14. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up to Exodus chapter 14. We're going to find our old friends, the Israelites, trapped on the wrong side of the Red Sea. While you're on your way to Exodus 14, let's go ahead and pray. We'll get into the text. Lord Jesus, help us uh, to be a people who hear, who listen, and who change. Lord, we're grateful for all the work that you've done to bring us to this point, but we're eager, God, for you to continue the good work that you've started in us. So, Lord, help us. Give us wisdom and humility and courage. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, A little context as you open in your Bibles to Exodus 14. Um, God's people, the Israelites, have been in the nation of Egypt for over 400 years. And they, over that period of time, have become the slaves to the Egyptian king Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, um, this is a bit of an understatement, he's not a nice man. Let's just put it that way. And so oppression and slavery and hardship are the results. In fact, Pharaoh's government looks at this nation of essentially illegal immigrants And they enact a policy of forced separation of children from their families. What would it look like is that the children that would be born to the Hebrew women were to be taken off of the birthing stool and thrown into the Nile River. And Moses, our hero in this story, was one of those children who was saved from this evil by a clever act of civil disobedience. So God's people, the Israelites, are oppressed in every possible way, and from their oppression, they cry out. And the Bible says in Exodus chapter 3 that God hears their cry, He sees their affliction, and He cares. That's the kind of God that we serve, a God who hears, who sees, and who cares. That's the God we worship. And so you move forward a couple of years, and Moses grows up, he becomes a man, and he finds himself um, standing in front of God at this place called the burning bush. And so God appoints Moses and his brother Aaron as messengers to go back to the Pharaoh to give him this message. Pharaoh, God says, let my people go that they may worship me in the wilderness. 
And there's probably a message or a sermon in about the fact that when we worship, we often are called into very desperate places like a wilderness to do so. But that's a different sermon. Pharaoh looks at this idea. He says, I'm sorry, I say what? You say, you want? You want me to do what? He says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, <laughs> no, not going to happen. And so Moses begins to... I think the right word is incentivize. He begins to incentivize the Pharaoh to help him see that this is God's plan. It'd be best if he went along with it. And so these are the the 10 plagues that you've probably heard enough about. And so there's this war of escalation that goes on between God against the Egyptian gods and Pharaoh. And eventually, Pharaoh relents and he sends all the Israelites away. In the middle of the night, all of the Israelites pack up their belongings and all of their things, all of their animals, their goats, their herds, their children, and they leave Egypt. Things are going great for about 12 hours. The problem is the next morning, Pharaoh wakes up and he has a realization. If your entire economy is based on slave labor, and then all of your slaves get up and walk out of your country overnight, it's going to leave a mark. He's like, what have I done? This is ridiculous. And then he, and he rounds up all of his chariots, all of his horsemen, all of his soldiers, and he sends them out to go pursue this nation of runaway slaves who, for their own turn, are now camped on the shore of the Red Sea. And they hear off into the distance the sound of thunder, and they look up to see the smoke rising from a thousand chariots, and they know exactly what this means. It's over. They've come. And there's nothing that we can do. And so, just as God's people almost always do in the face of certain death and danger, they begin to calmly pray for God's protection. (laughs) No, that's not at all what happens. They begin yelling at Moses because obviously this is all his fault. And so they tell Moses, Moses, we would have been happier, we would have been better off being slaves in Egypt than to die here in the sand. Why did you bring us out, Moses? You can take this whole Exodus business and shove it. Like, we are not on board with this. And Moses takes a deep breath, and he goes, says, God, you've got to show up right now. And then he turns around to the people, and he says this, fear not. Put yourself in the position of some sandal-clad slave who just left Egypt And coming towards you is the mightiest military force in the known world. And God's word to you is, fear not. (laughs) I love that. Stand firm and see the salvation of God, which he will work for you today. The Egyptians whom you see today, you will see no more. The Lord will fight for you. And you have only to be silent. So the rest of the story is that God sends down this thick pillar of cloud to block the way of the Egyptians. And then he turns around and he has Moses stretch his staff over the shore of the Red Sea. And he sends this strong east wind and it blows the waters back. And the people of Israel walk through the shore of the, or the, the, the dry bed of the Red Sea on dry ground. And as soon as they're through to the other side, then that pillar of cloud lifts and the Egyptians, bloodthirsty as they are, they rush forward down into the Red Sea just as the waters collapse back upon them in an exodus. 15, Miriam, Moses' sister, a prophet, leads the people in a song to say, how great and how wonderful is Yahweh, God. He has triumphed valiantly, the horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. And the people are saved from the threat of the Egyptians. Okay, so apart from a survey of the first 15 chapters of Exodus, what's going on here? Um, remember this, uh, the premise, the big idea for the sermon today? Remember that the result of rest is seeing the salvation of God. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do is help tie a connection between this idea of rest and God's salvation. So for the Israelites, salvation meant freedom from these external enemies, the Egyptians who tried to enslave them. For us today, rest often comes in the form of addictions or embodiment or captivity to internal enemies, 
right? Your smartphone, your refrigerator, the internet, whatever the case might be. Okay? So I want to ask a series of questions to help tie us this idea of God's rest and God's salvation together. So let's talk about God's salvation for a second. I'll ask a series of questions. Uh, first of all, anybody know how you're saved? Okay. It, it, give me, in, in a sentence, how do you know you're saved? Faith in Jesus. Thank you so much, Rose Gunn. I'll tell you what, God bless our senior saints. They know what's up. I'll tell you what, friends. You should have an answer for this question, right? If you didn't know, just the Sunday school answer, Jesus, it's always going to get you into the ballpark, okay? So it has something to do with Jesus. It has something to do with faith in Jesus, right? Bonus points. Anybody know where we might go in Scripture to give evidence to this? John 3, 16, if you, yeah, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, what, believes, has faith, right, shall not perish but have everlasting life. Another one is in Romans. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you, there's that word again, believe, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, what will happen? You will be saved. Okay, Whew. so far so good. All right, so let's come back to our question. How do we know that we're saved? It's because we have faith in Jesus. But how do I know if I have faith? And I see a lot of Christians get hung up here on this point because there's some confusion. Faith is such a fuzzy word, right? How do I know if I have faith? What behaviors, what actions, what set of habits or lifestyle can I point to and demonstrate that would suggest that I have faith that will save me. Did you ever thought about that? Imagine you didn't know a person and you just got a chance to follow them around and watch them. What behaviors would you be looking for to suggest whether or not that person believed in Jesus? So how do I know if I have faith? And I've often found that faith, because it's a fuzzy word, it's difficult for us to get our minds wrapped around it. There's a better synonym when we talk about faith and it's the word trust. So you know you have, tr you have faith if you trust that the promises of God are true. If you trust that the promises of God are true. Okay, let me pause here for a moment and tell you a quick story about my mom who doesn't trust credit card companies, okay? My mom is the most wonderful mom in the world, of course, um, but she's old school. She lives up in Alaska where high-speed internet quite hasn't made its way there. So she still has dial-up, and she still doesn't have a smartphone, so she doesn't do apps, right? A couple of weeks ago, I went to my mailbox, and I found a letter from my mom. Do you know what was inside? It was a newspaper article that she had clipped out of the newspaper because she thought I would enjoy that. Has anybody ever done that? You've gone and clipped a newspaper article, put it into an envelope, lick the envelope, stamp the envelope, put it in the mail. That was social networking in the 80s. This is, anybody ever do this? Is my mom the only one? Okay, thank you. Yes. Of us, yes. Okay. This is what we used to do. Now, I, I've just mentioned something. I see some of our younger people here in the audience. I want to make sure that we're all clear I just used a term you may not be familiar with. A newspaper <laughs> is an artifact from the early 20th century. They would actually cut down trees, put big sheets of paper, and then print the news on them. So when you woke up in the morning, listen to this, you could read about what happened yesterday. Totally wild, I know, but it actually happened. You can look it up. I'm not telling, I'm not, I'm not telling the truth. My mom, she lives in Alaska, but she flies to Vegas uh, once a month, maybe every six weeks. She doesn't have a gambling problem. She has a vitamin D problem. So she likes to go to Vegas because it's hot in Vegas and it's cold in Alaska, but she takes these ridiculous red-eye flights that will bring her out of Anchorage into PDX at like 5 or 5.30 in the morning. And so uh, one day she's like, hey, James, I'm coming into uh, Portland this Saturday for a quick layover. Would you want to come up? And the wonderful child that I am, I say, of course, Mom. I would love to get up at 4.30 to drive to PDX. <laughs> and so we do. And so we go and we have breakfast between the concourses. And when the bill comes at the end of the meal, she pays for it because she loves me. And then I see her fold up the receipt very dutifully, very particularly, and then she puts it into her purse. And I'm like, Mom, what are you doing? She's like, what do you mean? I'm saving my receipts. I'm like, why? 
She's like, well, the credit card company might make a mistake, and then I have to reconcile all of my receipts to the credit card statement that will come in the mail at the end of the month, and that way I can call them and tell them that you've overcharged me for my bagel and coffee at PDX. I'm like, mom. Now, I'm a good millennial. I don't really do paper, right? So I've got an app on my smartphone that notifies me the instant there's any activity on my credit card anywhere in the world. So I don't really, like, worry about credit card fraud because it's all kind of taken care of. But my mom doesn't do apps, and she doesn't do smartphones, so this is her solution. Because she doesn't cr trust the credit card company, she goes through all this extra effort to save all the receipts and go through line item by line on everything that she spends every month. And the point that I'm trying to make about my mom is that you can infer a level of trust in a relationship by the amount of activity and anxiety that's present. Typically speaking, the lower the level of trust, the more activity and anxiety you will engage in to make sure that everything's gonna be okay, right? Because you don't trust. So let's come back to this idea here. We've got this little step, this nested doll of questions, right? I trust, I, I use trust as a measure to show that I have faith and it's my faith that saves me. Well, how do I know if I'm actually trusting? And the answer is, is that you're resting. If you rest, it means that you trust. And if you trust, it means that you have faith. And if you have faith, then you're saved. The connection between salvation and rest is there. See, when you trust that it's actually the work of Jesus who saves you, you'll rest. Because trusting in the gospel necessarily, by definition, requires that you no longer trust in your activity and your anxiety and your performance for approval. By definition, it requires that you trust my previous point about how you can infer a level of trust from the level of activity or anxiety in a person's behavior, this is so crucial when it comes to understanding our salvation. It's our capacity to rest in the sufficiency of Christ that gives evidence to the trust that we have in the faith of Jesus that his promises are true, and it's that faith that saves us. See, on the shore of the Red Sea, our friends, the Israelites, were told to what? Stand still and see the salvation of God. In their rest, they were saved. The Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. You only have to be silent. In order for the Israelites to be saved that day, what was required of them was nothing. And on the shore of eternity, when you stand before the judgment seat of God, you will trust in the hands of the one who was pierced for your transgressions, who was bruised for your iniquities, who took upon himself the punishment for our sin, and who has made us acceptable and beloved to the Father. He has exchanged our unrighteousness for his righteousness. Timothy Keller, uh, if you know him, he's a great pastor out of uh, New York City. He's incredibly helpful. He wrote a book uh, called Romans 1 through 7 for you. I teach the Romans class at CBC. I encourage you to read this book or, better yet, take my class in the spring where this is assigned reading. Either way, you're going to be all right. Um, he has this little table here that distingu distinguishes the difference between legalism and the gospel. So inside of legalism... Legalism is a structure in which you're evaluated, measured, and judged by your performance, by your behavior, all right? And it tends to produce two types of people, all right? People who are either really judgmental or really anxious, and let me explain why. So legalism, underneath legalism, is the implication that you have to be good to be good. You have to earn it. And so if you're not that good at being good, you're going to constantly walk around with this low-grade fever. I'm not worth it. Jesus doesn't love me. If they only knew who I really was, if they only understood who I truly am, then no one would love me. Everyone would walk out of my life, including God himself. So this person is racked with a sense of 
guiltiness, a sense of insufficiency and unworthiness. And they'll usually manifest it through a series of masking behaviors to try to let people not see the real you. Very difficult for a legalistic person to be in authentic relationship because underneath them is this deep fear that if people really knew who they really were, no one would accept them, including God. So you get this really high anxiety. What's even worse, though, is the other side of the coin. It's the people who are really good at being good. This is terrible, and let me tell you why. I was this kid growing up. I was so good, I was homeschooled. My brother was the black sheep, and so I just decided that everything that he did, I'd do the opposite, and it worked out wonderfully for me. People loved me, and I loved being loved, and so it was easy to keep being good. And do you know what that got me? A whole heart full of arrogance and judgmentalism. Because what people do inside of legalism is they come up with a series of behaviors, a list of typically things that they're already good at, and they say, abiding by this list will make me acceptable. And so they evaluate their performance on their ability to, to complete the list, and then they look at everybody else who has sins that are different than their own, and they say, oh, God, thank you that I'm not like them. God, you're so lucky to have me. Look closely, I've mentioned this before. Jesus interacts with Pharisees and prostitutes. Watch the way that he does this. The Pharisee, this is the Pharisee, this is the legalist, this is the person who is dedicated to being really good and they've accomplished it. And yet their heart has turned into judgmentalism and self-righteousness and arrogance and they extend judgment to other people who aren't as good as being good. And it's good. Jesus says to them, you whitewashed tomb you have cleaned the outside of the cup, but the inside is full of rottenness and bitterness and judgmentalism. I was this kid. But the gospel comes into the situation and teaches the person both heavy under the weight of a load that they cannot bear or standing on top of a mountain of accomplishments that's creating pride and judgmentalism and says, actually, it's Jesus' work on the cross that is the key definitional characteristic for your right standing with God. You do not earn your righteousness. Rather, you receive it as a free gift for what Jesus has done. And if you receive that free gift for what Jesus has done, then one, it takes away anxiety. Why? Because it wasn't you who made yourself acceptable in the first place. Why do I love my kids? Because they're my kids. That's it. They're my kids and I love them and I love them because they're my kids. And Jesus looks at you and he says, I have made you acceptable to the Father through your faith in me. So you are not just declared not guilty, you're adopted into the family. So your anxiety decreases. And to the legalistic, judgmental person who stands on their mountain of accomplishments out of pride, Jesus would say to you, step down from there because that actually, actually is just filthy rags in the sight of the Father. No matter how you've good you've been, you can never be good enough. So you know what you're better off doing is just receiving my free gift. Receiving my free gift. The other thing it does is that if you're in legalism, you'll look at guilt, right? The bad things that you do will end up creating guilt and shame. And so because inside legalism there's this like scale, good and evil, and your good better outweigh your bad, and if it doesn't, then you're really guilty to, to try to do it this way, right? Don't do that. The Bible says that all of the things that you have done, good and evil alike, have been wrapped up under the grace of Jesus, and now he takes from you not just good and evil, he gives back to you his perfection. His perfection. When God looks at you, he sees the perfection of Jesus. It's so beautiful. The gospel says, look, you go through your guilt to go rest in what Christ has done. Friends, I'm a massive mess. <laughs> And yet, I aim to trust in Jesus because of what he's done. Now, anytime we do something like this, and I tell you that your performance and your behavior, it doesn't matter in the eyes of God, a lot of people are like, did he just say that it doesn't matter what I do? Because I can think of some things I'd like to do. And if it doesn't matter, then it doesn't matter. Okay, and here's, here's the flip side to this coin. 
okay? Your good work does not earn your right standing before God, but rather it's received so that now you're free to go out and do good work. In fact, if you are, by, oh man, it's just, again, Romans 6, right? The Bible says that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Well, wait a minute. Does that mean should I sin more that grace can superabound? And Paul's like, no. No, absolutely not. Don't you know that if you have died to sin, you can no longer live in it? You see, when we receive the perfect, when we see the perfect record of Christ's righteousness into our lives, the part of us that desired sin dies, has been put to death. We now have a new life in Christ. The challenge between the legalistic person and the gospel-centered person is that on the outside, their life is going to look very much the same. It's really tough to tell them apart, but inside there's this key difference. The legalistic person is using works-based righteousness, is using their behavior and their performance, their constant go, 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 look at me, aren't I special, aren't I talented, aren't I gifted, watch me go, as a means to get God's favor and acceptance. They're working for God's love. The gospel person-centered says, if it's true that Jesus is actually what matters, then I'm working from the position of God's love and favor. Do you see the difference? You're going to end up doing many of the same behaviors and activities, but one is going to be for the approval of God or others, and the other one is going to be from a place of deep-seated confidence that you're actually accepted and loved by God, and that means that you can rest. That means that you can rest as though the words of Christ are actually true. All right, we started this by talking about this idea of Sabbath, taking one day out of seven just to kind of stop and create a holy moment in your week where you connect with God, your family, and your friends. The fundamental principle of rest is that it's evidence of God's goodness and salvation in your life. You're free to live a non-anxious, calm, confident presence in the world around you. And friends, if you want to be a, a really curious missionary, if you want people to notice you as a Christian, I recommend calm, non-anxious presence. I don't know if you've noticed this. There's a bunch of stuff to freak out about in the world around us. Every week, uh, some friends of mine get together down at the tap room here in town. And uh, the bartender there knows us because we've been going for a couple of years, and it's always the same time, same night. And so we were just chatting one, a couple of weeks ago, and she asked me, how are you doing? And I said, without thinking about it too much, I'm doing great. And she stopped and she said, how are you doing so great? Now think about her world. She serves patrons all day long, and she asks the same question, how are you doing? What do you think she hears a lot? I'm okay. Busy. I said, I'm doing great. And I wasn't trying to boast. I'm not, the only reason I'm doing great, what, here's what I told her. I said, it's because I love Jesus and I stick close to good friends. She's like, wow. If you want to make a difference, if you want to open up a line of communication with somebody who is living a very busy, hurried, anxious life, I recommend trusting Jesus just a smidge more because it'll make a difference in your demeanor. It'll make a difference in how you talk about your day. Why? Because you're seeing things from a different perspective. You see that Jesus is true to his promises, and though you may not understand exactly how those promises will come to pass, you can rest that they are actually true. I deal with a, a lot of people, and a lot of people will end up wanting my time, getting a meeting with me, and I'll often start a conversation with somebody who says, Pastor, I understand that you're so busy but can we meet? And it just, it bothers me, right? And it's not that I'm not busy. I think a lot of people pa think that pastors work just like one day a week, but you know. Um, it's not that I'm not active. It's not that I don't have things to do, but it's like, don't you get it? Like, you are my work, right? And it's not just pastors, it's parents and managers and bosses and anybody who lives in the world around you. All of us like rush around with this kind of busyness like a badge. Has anybody ever been in a conversation where you just realize the person is trying to convince you how important they are by telling you how busy they are? 
oh my gosh, how exhausting. Like, I just want to like, I just want to like select out of that conversation, like as a culture, like it's not good. It's not good to be that busy. And yet we kind of fall into this idea that in order to be important, in order to be successful, in order to be meaningful, in order to have status in our world, you have to be busy. And friends, what will happen then is that a child will interrupt you. A needy person will interrupt you. A coworker or a client will interrupt you, and you will see them as an inconvenience to your busyness instead of as an opportunity to reflect the love and the grace of Christ. As Christians, we aspire to be more than just busy. We aspire to be people who can carry the presence of Christ with us and meet the needs of the world in front of us from a place of non-anxious confidence and trust that the promises of God are true and that we can rest. And read the Gospels again. Jesus was constantly angering people by how much rest he was taking. It's okay to have boundaries. It's okay to say, I'm not going to respond to that email right now. It's okay to say, I'll get to that later. There's something more important going on here. And that's my ability to rest and trust. AJ's big point in that book on subversive Sabbath is that rest reflects a steady trust in a God who never slumbers or sleeps. And if that's the case, friends, what can you do? Slumber or sleep? The two most, uh, this is mostly true, I think, the two most prescribed medications in the United States today are antidepressants and sleep meds. That's a symptom of a culture that's bought into the wrong worldview. There's a whole other conversation out there about mental health and anxiousness and anxiety that this is not trying to touch on. I'm just trying to ask you to say, what would it look like in my life if I actually trusted that Jesus was who he says he was and through the, the consistent habit of taking one day out of seven, I enacted in spiritual warfare to tear down the strongholds of busyness. We can rest because we trust that God is still at work even when we are not. Zoom out for a second. God was God before you were born. He's going to be God after you die. Friends, I hate to break it to you. You're not that big of a deal. <laughs> I mean, in the scheme of things, in terms of what God is attempting to do to bring about the cosmic redemption of all of creation, to wrap everything up underneath the lordship of Christ, you get to play a part, and hallelujah, it's the best life to live. Surrender everything into the mission of, of expanding the kingdom of God and proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. But friends, he's been on this mission for a long time, and it doesn't depend on you working late. It doesn't depend on you answering every email. It doesn't depend on you being always on, always available, always accessible. See, God is God and we are not. And if we get those two things flipped, then all of a sudden we think that we're everybody's savior and that's not a burden we are meant to bear. So I want to release you from the burden of having to be someone else's savior. It's Jesus who can save. You're just going to muck it up. So you're not that big of a deal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We've been trying to grow a church through like positive psychology for the last 20 years. I don't think it's working. I think we need to like have a lot more humility. <laughs> One of the most, I'll finish with this. One of the most influential books in my life was a guy uh, written by Eugene Peterson. Eugene Peterson embodies this in a really fascinating way if you know him. He's the guy who translated the message. Anyway, great guy. He writes this book called The Contemplative Pastor. If you're, it's for pastors, but it's, it's applicable to any leader. And he, chapter two is called The Unbusy Pastor, in which he talks about his relationship to this concept of busyness. And he uses uh, an idea from another book, uh, Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Did you guys read that in high school and then promptly forget about it? Okay. 
let me remind you, Moby Dick is about this white whale. Actually, it's about Captain Ahab and his pursuit of this white whale. And so back in the late 1800s, they would take these whaling ships, these big schooners with big masts, and they'd go out and they'd ply the seas and they'd look for whales. And then when they finally found a whale, then all of the crew would lower into these boats and the boats would be manned by men at oars and they would go out and they would try to harpoon the whale and then drag behind it for days at a time until the whale finally tired out. And then they would, anyway, it's literally how, we, it's, it's how they made lamp oil. Thank God for electricity. Save the whales. Here's what Melville says. Uh, they would hunt these whales by loading these smaller whale boats, powered by men and oars. And here's Melville. Struggling against the sea, every muscle taunt, all attention and energy concentrated on the task at hand. In this boat, however, there is one man who does nothing. He doesn't hold an oar. He doesn't perspire. He doesn't shout. He is calm in the crash and the cursing. This man is the harpooner, poised and quiet, waiting. And then there's this sentence. To ensure the greatest efficiency in the dart, the harpooners of this world must start to their feet out of idleness and not out of toil. Friends, the labor that we have been given in this world is such a high calling that we do ourselves a disservice by thinking it should be done all of the time. We've been called to be salt and light in this world, to be people who communicate the love and the image of Christ to a world around us. To do that, you have to come to a place of entering into the, the chaos and the cursing and the shouting of your daily week not from a place of toil, but from a place of idleness, from a place of rest, knowing that you're still accepted and beloved because of what Jesus has done, not because of your status. This to me is, if you want to get more done, which you should, you might start by doing a little less, by carving out a boundary, by saying this time is different than the other time. I want you to think about your week. Imagine seven days in a week and then think about three blocks in each day from waking up to lunch, lunch to dinner, dinner to going to bed. I want you to think about three of those blocks in a row. They don't all have to be in the same day, but three of those blocks in a row are set aside sacred. For pastors, Sabbath is always weird because like obviously this is not my day off, <laughs> right? But for me, it starts this afternoon and will continue through tomorrow evening. And that's the time that I've set aside. Not, and don't hear me out here, it's not like I have to go sit on the couch with my feet up. My God, I have three children. Like, you know, it's like my wife. No, 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 stop it. It's a bad idea, right? It doesn't mean idleness. It means finding activities that are separate from your regular work life that rejuvenate and invest in you. That's what it means. So that's going to look a lot differently for anyone. It will often look different for the spouses in the relationship. And you guys got to kind of sort out what that's going to look like as you craft your week together. But it doesn't mean idleness. It just means this time apart. And I do that because come Tuesday morning, I'm going to start running. And if I'm already exhausted on Tuesday morning, then my life is out of order. There's a reason that the majority of heart attacks in the United States happen between Saturday evening at 8 p.m. and Monday morning at 5 a.m. The data is unequivocal. Most heart attacks happen to men around Monday morning at 5 a.m. Why? Because we've gotten into this idea where our work kills us. And God is asking us to rest. So if you're a senior saint, if you're one of our prime timers here, and you're like, well, today's Saturday, and well, tomorrow's kind of Saturday too, and the day after that is kind of still Saturday, right? I want you to find rhythms where you still need to invest. Friends, you're old. You're not dead, okay? You still have so much that God has given you. Please don't sit on the sideline and think that I don't have anything left to offer. Network with other people. Find ways to mentor and to invest and love and still find ways to rest, okay? Retirement, not in the Bible, FYI, okay? 
If you're in like the young kid phase, like my wife and I were a while back, oh my gosh, it is so hard. You have my love and I know what you're going through to a little bit. If you're around a young family that just gave birth, there was a family here at the nine o'clock, I saw them come in, oh, we just put our baby in the nursery for the first time. I'm like, why are you here? Like, go to Starbucks right now. Like, just get some time away. Like, if you need to sleep during the service, do it. Because it come, it's so difficult to rest with young, with, with young kids. So if you can be that place where, hey, can I take your kids for just 90 minutes? I will tell you what a young mom needs more than anything else in the world is 90 minutes in their own home without the little shin kickers running around. <laughs> and if you're in that mid-career professional phase and you're like, like I've been sitting here for an hour and 10 minutes and already I know I probably got like 60 new emails in my inbox and like it is very difficult for me to shut off because I got a smartphone and that thing tethers my head to the office and my work is renting space in my brain 24 seven. Remember, you are not your work. Your identity is not in your productivity. And if you want your productivity to increase, this is not me. This is every occupational scientist and HR professional out there. They will say there's a law of diminishing return. You are not better to your company because you put in 60, 70, 80 hours a week. You're worse. Take a day off. Be released from the obligation to be always on, always accessible. Take a rest because Jesus has done it all for you. Christ has called us to be salt and light in the world. Let us take up this call to work really hard for the sake of the world from a place of idleness and not toil, from a place of rest and not anxiety. So it's up to you. Figure it out. What three-block section are you going to commit to to say, this is my sacred time? See what happens. I encourage you to join us in this adventure of the Sabbath. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Lord, help us to repent of the addiction to busyness and to the status that comes with it. Lord, there's a lot of people in here with a lot of stuff on their plates and they're feeling already overwhelmed and they're already working seven days a week. So Lord, I ask that you give them clarity to help them restructure their role and how they spend their time so that they might meet their work from a place of restedness rather than toil. Father, I ask for grace for our young families here. God, would you make nap times long, evenings full of sleep so that our parents can rest. God, I ask for your grace upon us all that we may see your rhythms as being worthwhile. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And